Welcome everyone back to the afternoon session of the parliamentary track as AI regulation looms, understanding its governance in the Asia Pacific. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and their continuing connection to land, sea and community. I pay my respect to them and their cultures and to the elders, both past and present. I would like to also extend that respect to those participating here today and online. I'd like to thank the government of Australia and the IGF Secretariat for coordinating to bring the parliamentary track to our region alongside the Asia Pacific Regional Internet Governance Forum. So welcome everyone. My name is Jennifer Chung. I have the honor of being the moderator for this session. Um, I work for Dot Asia organization. It's a not-for-profit organization. It's a community-based, um, membership-based organization headquartered in Hong Kong. Uh, we are the registry operator for the Dot Asia top-level domain, and every Dot Asia domain actually contributes to the work that we do for the region, which includes our support as a secretariat for the APRGF, which. Uh, was happening these past days and including you know part of this being here at the parliamentary track for those who have joined us um, in these really interesting and fruitful discussions these past days you would know that the overarching theme for aprgf this year is emerging technologies is asia pacific ready for the next phase of the internet and you might have heard in the opening plenary that really just a few years ago uh, we saw AI governance, data governance, and internet governance as quite separate spheres. But today, the lines between them are blurring. There are many issues and policy matters that are cross-cutting. And it's all the more important that we talk about them in the context of the wider conversation around internet governance, AI being one of the many emerging technologies that are enabled to flourish because we have the internet. The UN Office um, of the Secretary General's Envoy on Technology issued a public call for nominations to the high level advisory body on artificial intelligence. This public call for nominations just closed yesterday. And this multi stakeholder advisory body kind of just shows us that the, the, the conversation around AI is really heating up at all levels, at national levels, regional levels, and really at the global level. And this uh, multi-stakeholder advisory body was initially proposed in 2020 as part of the Secretary General's Roadmap for Digital Corporation. Um, AR regulation is really still in the very early stages, both in the US and within our own region. I hear that you know Singapore is working with other ASEAN nations to develop and produce a set of guidelines on respons responsible use of AI in the region, which they expect to be released in early 2024. With that kind of setting the scene here, we have a lovely uh, distinguished panel of experts who will tell you all about AI. Right next to me, I have Tenanoya Samoa. She is the Chief Executive Officer at Tuvalu Telecommunications Corporation. She has over 20 years of experience in the ITC sector. And in, in addition to her various positions, she's also serving as a member of the UN Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group. She is an executive member of the Tuvalu Women for Change organization, and she's previously a board member of the Pacific Island chapter of the Internet Society, Pick ISOC. Uh, next to her, we have Bart Hogevin. I hope I didn't pronounce your name wrong. <laughs> I'm trying really hard here. He is the deputy director uh, for cyber technology and security of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, and he oversees research, dialogues, projects relevant to Australia's engagements on cyber and technology issues in the Indo-Pacific. He's also an expert on issues relating to cyber issues pertaining to international peace and security, international aid and national security. He has initiated a lot of the work on international rules, norms and standards. 
uh, in cyberspace. And um, he has been, um, let me see. Oh, working very closely with the member states of ASEAN, uh, as well as participation in the UN open-ended working group on implementation of norms and strat strategizing um, Australia and its partners involvement in the standards making processes. That's a mouthful for me. I'm sorry if I mangled it. Next to Bart, I have with us uh, Mamta Siwakoti. She is the director uh, of Digital Law and Policy Center of Nepal. She is a licensed advocate and co-founder of the Digital Law and Policy Center. And apart from her personal practice of law, she also runs a very flourishing legal literacy campaign under the name of the Digital Lawyer via social media since 2020. And she educates um, people um, of their rights and laws uh, in Nepal. And last but not least, we do have our online speaker, uh, Amrita Chowdhury. She is the director of CCAOI. Uh, she has many, many titles, one of which is the, she's also a member of the UNIGF uh, multi-stakeholder advisory group. She's also chair of the Internet Governance uh, Forum Support Association, IGFSA. She is the chair of the Asia Pacific Regional at Large Structure, AP Rallo. And she is the president of the Internet Society India Delhi chapter. And just yesterday, she was announced to be the chair of the APRGF multi-stakeholder steering group. Um, that is a lot of titles. So we do have a lot of expertise here to talk to you about, you know, understanding AI governance in our region. I'd like to start with Bart. And if Bart could really just kind of give us the current framework on global governance of AI and the representation of Asia Pacific in this dialogue. Bart, over to you. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, good afternoon to you all. A parliament, for a parliamentary track, it was an extensive lunch break. So hopefully we'll get, let's say, uh, some energy back in, in the room as well as in the discussion. Um, while I was kind of preparing for the session during that, that lunch break, um, I obviously knew, let's say, of Tuvalu with its domain name, um, make, making a massive contribution to national income. Virtu is not another domain name which is currently making a lot of income from, um, from its, its, the idea of syncrasy of, let's say, being .ai. Uh, does anyone know which country that is? It's, it's a, uh, a small island in the Caribbean called, called Anguilla, which is a British territory. And I think the .ai domain makes up now 25% of its gross national income, which is amazing, which is amazing, I think, both for Tuvalu, um, but also for this small island developer nation. Um, that aside, um, thanks for the introduction. Um, and maybe a, a few words of introduction before I kind of uh, segue into the actual question. Um, about a year and a half ago, we started a, uh, a project which was funded both by, no, which was funded by the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade under the Australia India Cyber and Critical Tech Partnership. And at the time, there was a lot of debate about um, we need to do more about technical standards. Technical standards are the future. And we looked at that and said, okay, well, do we actually know what this is all about? What, 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 what's, what are the processes? What's the governance? Uh, around technical standards when it pertains to new and emerging technologies. So we did a research project, which is about to launch, let's say hopefully in the next couple of weeks, which looks at the kind of the diplomatic, the governance framework around artificial intelligence and in particular the governance around technical standards for AI. Um, and I think this is relevant for a number of reasons because I think we see a variety of jurisdictions now um, not just confronting the looming of national regulation, but maybe also the dooming of national regulation. Uh, I think even in Australia, the minister, uh, the minister for uh, Minister Husek, let's say, announced, let's say, his proposal for a national AI law or regulation. Um, and I think all of that is obviously each country's sovereign right and sovereign entitlement. But I think there are two key elements to any form of legislation, any form of regulation um, concerning AI that is relevant. One is that any piece of legislation in order to be effective and be meaningful needs to be based on some agreed international norms or principles. That's let's say on top of, let's say your national regulation uh, or legislation. 
And I think underneath that, the, every piece of legislation or regulation needs to be based on some forms of international agreed standards, technical standards. If you don't have that, um, I think your legislation is uh, probably very ineffective or it actually um, puts you out of competition uh, in terms of, let's say, reaping the benefits of, of new and emerging technologies, including from AI. Um, and I think it begs the question whether, if, that's, if you're not meeting those criteria, whether any form of national legislation or regulation uh, makes any difference uh, or, or is effective in the first place. Now, if you then look at uh, the variety of governance instruments that are out there. So I talked about, let's say, international uh, principles, international norms. Um, you can talk about uh, pieces of legislation and regulation that's coming out. Uh, you can talk about this whole variety of technical standards in which in the internet community has, has been very strong over the past decades. Now, I think you can absorb, uh, observe two main things there if you look, at, let's say, at the flurry of activity that's been happening in the past years. One is, for those of you who have been following the debate, lots of statements have been coming out. I think we're counting about 20 to 30 uh, of different forums that have uh, presented, declared, um, agreed principles of responsible use of AI or responsible development of AI technologies. That's coming out of UNESCO, it's coming out of the G20, it's coming out of the EU, it's coming out of NATO, it's coming out of the Quad uh, and, and, and the G7. So there's a whole kind of collection now of, of high-level principle statements. Um, I think two observations there. They are very, these are, these are very high level. Um, these are also, I think, related to a relatively small group, I think UNESCO excluded, a relatively small group of, let's say, minilateral or smaller group of like-minded nations who have kind of started this. Not so much a global effort, um, um, and, 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 and as, again, let's say uh, an effort of mostly kind of like-minded and highly advanced nations and technology advanced nations. I think we'll talk about that uh, a bit more. If you look at the number of activities around technical standards, there, are, there is a variety of initiatives out there. But if you look at the work of, let's say, the current standards bodies that you would expect to be involved, such as the International Standards Organization, partly maybe even the IATF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, um, or some of the regional standards development organizations, there has not been happening so much yet. And I think that also asks the question whether the current system of global governance, be that, let's say, at the multilateral level in the re within regional organization, you refer to ASEAN. I don't think ASEAN, I'm disclosing any secret that ASEAN is not known as kind of being the most effective regional body to encourage harmonization of standards or, or common rules. Um, although the initiative in itself is, I think, um, um, should, should be applauded. Um, that, that we're kind of seeing, uh, uh, that I think it begs the question whether the current system is able to A, meet the demands of the market, which I think are growing, but I also, and I think that's where it relates to the discussion, will be able to meet the demands of the public, uh, of our constituencies and of governments. Um, and then the question is, if new initiatives pop up, are we in the Asia Pacific sufficiently represented on those forums? And I think we'll touch on that a little bit later in the discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Bart, for giving a really good kind of setting the scene of the context of the discussion, especially with regards to, to our region. There seems to be a lot of things flourishing right now, but there's no kind of any uh, more organized kind of consensus or, or all of these different statements are coming out. How do we kind of wade through it and how can we in the Asia Pacific make sure we are at the table and we do have our um, voices actually out there saying how, what we think responsible use for AI is how we should structure legislation and uh, regulation in, in our region. I'd like now to turn to Noya to give us some kind of perspective, especially from the Pacific Small Island States. Uh, Noya, what, um, what is happening there and, and your thoughts? Yeah, thank you, uh, Jennifer. And yeah, thank you, Bart, for mentioning .tv. Yeah, that's us, that's Tuvalu. I'm from Tuvalu. Um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to contribute and share the perspective from the Pacific Island countries. So I will, I will 
basically um, look at how can we strengthen cooperation uh, within the Pacific region across uh, key stakeholders and partners, so identifying um, the key stakeholders that, you know, um, can drive this uh, 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 and push for um, awareness on, on AI. Um, as Bart mentioned, um, I mean, and other speakers before this, um, this week mentioned the diversity of, of the region uh, geographically with many challenges as well. But um, if we um, stand together and identify the key st um, stakeholders and um, partners such as you know, the government, um, the role that the government plays in terms of engaging, um, try to engage the government in the Pacific region to um, create a collaborative framework or um, establish a regional task force that you know, um, look or dedicate in um, looking at AI governance. This is one of an important um, uh, key aspect to identify as well as industries. You know, in the Pacific, we don't have very large intensive industries, but still we need to ensure a balanced representation of interest and exp expertise from a large corporation as well as uh, startups. Um, I also wanted to mention um, one of our a partner like uh, experts from abroad and the need to bring together ac academics, um, researchers and professional with experience in AI ethics, uh, as well as policy. And of course, technology, we need to come together and um, understand, have a, 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 a good understanding of how our emerging technology is playing in the, in the region. So by doing that, how, how can we, we strengthen this uh, cooperation? We have to look at establishing um, collaborative platforms, uh, create pl platforms for um, communication, um, a platform that we can use to share information, um, maybe an online portal or website that is dedicated for Pacific Island countries in the region. I, I, I'm, I'm sure that if we do this, it will facilitate um, a lot of discussions, um, share resources and provide updates, especially on AI related initiative in the, in the region. Um, the other point I wanted to mention is to the engagement of international organization. I, I believe that collaboration and um, it, with international bodies, um, particularly those that focus on um, AI ethics, um, I think that it's very important uh, to gain insight and expertise from a, a global perspective, especially uh, small island countries like us. Uh, you know, AI is, it's been there, but um, never been realized that much in, in small island states. So that insight is very important. And also uh, I wanna touch base on the, the, the importance of our policy development and harmonization, because we have to work towards harmonizing AI policies and uh, regulation across the Pacific. Um, this will avoid, I think some of the discussion around fragmentation, um, we have, like Bart was uh, mentioning, we have to ensure consistency in standards. Um, I think uh, this might involve, you know, participating in regular meetings, consultation at the regional level, and of course, use those portal to share information among governments in, in the region. Uh, the second point I wanna touch while we're discussing on this is um, engage in international um, dialogue such as this, I think participation um, of Pacific Islanders in this kind of forums or um, conference is it's, it's very low. So I, I, I encourage um, Pacific people to come and participate in international forums, uh, conferences and discuss on you know, the importance of AI governance, just to share um, insight and learn um, from other regional um, experience. I think the need for more Pacific Islanders is it's, it will bring the flavor, uh, how we look, the perspective of Pacific and how we can, can come in and participate in these kind of forums to address um, uh, um, AI governance. And just, just a last bit on what I wanna cover is the policy advocacy. I think advocating for the importance of, uh, you know, a, a more responsible AI at the regional as well as the, in the global forums, it's, it's very important. And it's good to encourage the governments from the Pacific Island countries to prioritize um, artificial intelligence ethics and, and governance in, in their agenda, because it's, it's very important. We don't, in the Pacific, we don't really take this seriously, but um, emerging technologies, it's, it's kind of come in and 
people start to realize that you know there are positive and there are um, a negative sides of um, emerging technology. So it is very important. I think I, I, I covered pretty much of the first part. Or do we? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Noya, for, for the perspective from the Pacific uh, point of view. I think it's increasingly important uh, um, to increase participation from the Pacific Islands. And I am so glad that we are able to have this here, uh, the in-person part. Of course, we have online participants as well in, in this region. Uh, and this is the second time that APRGF and its related, I guess, side meetings that are, are actually based in in the Pacific region. Previously, we were here in 2018 in Vanuatu, and this year we are so lucky to be here in, in, in Brisbane, Australia. And I think this also encourages more participation from the further reaches of the Asia Pacific region to be able to be at the table to discuss these really important matters. Uh, um, and I think it, this is the information sharing and knowledge sharing that I think, Noya, you, you highlighted that is a, one of the very crucial things that you think should happen for the Pacific Island states. Uh, I think this is a great segue because you also mentioned uh, the importance of, of AI ethics and public and policy advocacy for responsible AI. I'd like to switch all the way back to the other end of our region in lovely Nepal, and I want to go to Mamta. And, I, and Mamta is, of course, a lawyer, so maybe you can give us kind of a flavor of what the, the concerns are in Nepal. And as a lawyer and a, and a legal advocate for a lot of these issues, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So I would like to get a little bit on the basics of uh, what kind of human rights frameworks we are looking at. And given the fact that um, this definitely might sound a little daunting to policymakers, especially from developing regions, developing countries within our region, because um, not many policymakers might come from technical background. And when we say ethical AI and uh, AI policymaking, it might seem like it's a completely new area that we do not know of and we do not really know where to start about. However, a thing to note is that while AI is a new technology, the law surrounding it and the principle of human rights that it might violate remain the same. It is still about protecting the civil and political rights. It is still about ensuring equal access to new technologies and opportunities. It is still about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that Eleanor Roosevelt unveiled in 1948. And it is still about the nine core human rights treaties we have. We have human rights treaties on protection of children, on protection of women. We have a human rights treaty on racial discrimination, ending racial discrimination, on uh, rights of person with disabilities. So uh, these, these are our human rights, our civil and political rights, which, and, but, and I want to remind us all that this is an area we are all too familiar with and something that we have fought to ensure throughout years. So it is not a completely new paradigm. It is just about incorporating emerging technology within the paradigm that we have already set, not just nationally or regionally, but, but globally. And one of the principles, uh, one of the principles that government and civil society can employ and have employed throughout time when it comes to balancing conflicting interests of uh, human rights and government interest is the, um, the principle of weighted balancing of strict uh, scrutiny standard. That means whenever context of gender, race, or individual right is at stake owing to surveillance or technology, weighted balancing involves evaluating the significance and weight of the competing interest involved so that we can find a, a balancing ground within. Now, EU has led the path towards the adoption of such regulation. So what started at around 2021 has culminated into a series of obligation for AI that governments are agreeing upon in that region. So the European Parliament adopted its uh, negotiating position on AI Act, and these rules would ensure that AI developed and used in Europe is fully in line with EU rights, including the rights, the human rights principle, the privacy principle, transparency, 
and non-discrimination principle that we have all globally agreed upon. So I would just like to give a brief overview of this draft so that it can help us understand how AI regulation are being developed throughout the world. So this draft is not that complicated. It imposes a progressive restriction on the usage of AI. Like for instance, it has divided it into four different dimension. The first one is prohibition, complete prohibition on certain AI such as biometric identification, uh, profiling, racial profiling, predictive policing, emotion recognition, among others. So these are prohibited completely. Now, there are also high risk AI, which has stricter standards of control regulation, which is used in sectors that can cause significant harm on issues such as health, safety, fundamental rights, very sensitive issues such as election. And then there is obligation for general purpose of AI that does not really have significant harm on all these sectors. And at the same time, it, it also has regulation which warrants and which creates a safe but conducive space for innovations in AI by giving out license to open source companies so that they don't feel hindered as well. So similar ideas of needing a regulatory framework has also been pushed by india china hong kong maybe in the second part we can come a little we can touch a little more on regional politics and how it is not really necessary for each of the country to follow eu regulation or some other regulation that has been brought out as long as we stand by the human right standards and human right conventions that we have already agreed upon so even india china and hong kong have cited in our region especially they have cited that there is a need for a regulation uh, when it comes to AI, especially in midst of growing threats such as misinformation and disinformation. So many have recognized that um, issues such as deep fake is definitely de detrimental and all of the countries are in similar position. Um, rather, albeit it not be in a global level, on national level, they're on similar position on requiring a regulation. But uh, again, now in regards to whether we are already in that position, we definitely are not. So, um, and government alone, policymaker alone will definitely not be able to achieve this by themselves. So for now, it is definitely the engineers in big, te big tech company who design AI system rather than us policymakers. And currently there are no framework that can direct these big tech companies to ensure safe AI design. So what can be done at this point, now the ethical, the human right framework being the la larger picture on the long run, what can be done at this point um, in regards to promoting human right principle is definitely that has been already stated by my fellow uh, speakers, definitely engaging civil society, promoting stronger discussion on safe AI and trustworthy AI forums as such, APRIGF, Parliamentary TAC, UNIGF, if policymakers can show their interest and if they can showcase their strong commitment towards ensuring that human right principles are upheld in these issues, this might also make it easier for them to come on a regional platform, on a multi-country, multi-stakeholder platform and later advocate on these very regulation. Because for now, civil society can pressure private entities and on a larger run, civil societies, private sector and government can come together to advocate the regulations that for now is is being seen sort of skeptically by certain governments so thank you and we can continue the second thank you mamta for that i think we touched on quite a lot of um AI ethics and concerns around a lot of the more uh, high risk AI uh, technologies, and, and you've included deep fakes and also AI technologies being used during, I guess, elections. And that is also a concern that's shared with a lot of, I guess, nations that are coming up. There's a lot of very important elections coming up. I'd like to stay in the sub region and go to um, Amrita. Amrita, um, if we can have Amrita on the screen. Yes, Amrita, what is the, the concerns mostly, I guess, from the Indian perspective and also your work uh, on this? Amrita, if you can please give us a little bit of your thoughts. Um, thanks, Jen, and uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I'll just take a step back and comment on certain statements which were made. As in, if you are looking at when AI regulations today are made, if we say Asia Pacific is not there, it is incorrect because there are some countries of Asia Pacific, such as Japan, who have been involved. And this is also mentioned in uh, you know, the Secretary General's 
um, document that you know countries like US or the bloc of EU or Japan have been involved. And if we look at Asia Pacific, we are very diverse. We have extremely developed countries like Japan. Uh, we have countries like China, India in the middle, Australia. Then you have uh, countries who are not technology at that development, like some Pacific islands, smaller nations, etc. So um, I think everyone has their interests. Uh, bigger country, you know, when you have companies coming into countries which have huge population, etc., which is a huge market for them, they still listen. But when it is smaller countries, they do not listen. Um, you know, issues of how data is gathered, how the privacy is man maintained, etc., becomes an issue. So everyone has a stake, but how are those stakes represented is important. Uh, so yes, I agree with all the panelists that there needs to be dialogue uh, on it. Um, they need to understand how it is. And we also have to realize that AI can be used for good. It is being used for environment. It is being used for agriculture. It is being used for fisheries. As in, uh, there is a threat of jobs going, but there is also an opportunity of getting things done. Uh, as in, if we look at India, also we are having many startups coming up, looking, you know, using AI in a, a you know, in a responsible way, and it is happening across the region. It's just not India. Um, but we need to see how do we enhance the good and balance the concerns. For example, there are concerns of ethics. There are concerns of discrimination being racial. You know, the kind of data which is gathered in many places is discriminating or the way that it is interpreted and used. Um, human rights, the privacy concerns, uh, IP protection. You, 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 even in US, you had, you know, this debate currently going on on IP rights, et cetera, music, et cetera. So those are things which needs to be addressed and there and if you look at it, um, we, we have a concern or there are concerns, genuine concerns that big tech does not follow ethics. However, it, it is interesting to see even they have ethical frameworks which they are supposed to follow. Today, the concern is people are not adhering to them. As in, we have multiples of principles and even at the IGF, at the Policy Network on AI, we are looking at it. For example, you have the OECD principle, you have UNESCO coming up with their framework, you have, um, you know, you have several, ITU has been working on it. And, even countries are coming up with frameworks um, uh, or even regional blocks. But the issue is one is not talking to the other. There is no harmonization or common agreement on certain aspects. Like for example, the GPAI is also talking of something. G, uh, the G20, the um, BRICS recently discussed of come, uh, forming a subgroup working on AI recommendations. You know, everyone's into the bandwagon, but there needs to be more talking, more, uh, I would say, cohesion between between these things, um, you know, everyone's talking about frameworks. China has come up with a framework for even generative AI, but is one talking to the other? Um, it's not. That that is where the. What about interoperability? How are the ethics, uh, gender, race, etc., working? And that's something which the IGF is working on, and I can go to it later. But yes, there needs to be more cooperation. There needs to be more dialogue, and I would say, uh, leaving aside our geopolitics, if not only a Pacific block or a South Asia block or some blocks come and talk. I think the entire of Asia Pacific needs to talk about it. Learn from the best practices. For example, of if something on agriculture has worked somewhere, perhaps it can not be directly replicated, but you can take inspiration of it and uh, work. Uh, you know, work. For example, uh, as Mamta mentioned, EU is kind of uh, formed their AI regulation, but EU regulation may not work in Asia be because um, or Pacific because there are concerns that e the regulations which EU comes up with um, stifle uh, businesses as in it, it harms innovation as in good, we, I do not want to go into it, but this is a concern which many raise. And in our region, we want to grow, we want to develop, we want to nurture smaller enterprises, startups, et cetera. So that may not work. We would have to customize. So nations in their way may customize the regulations, but there has to be some uh, broader guidance which e everyone agrees and abides to because the frameworks are there. The issue is implementation and abidance to them. So I think I'll stop here and in the next round, perhaps I can share what the PNAI is doing and how we are trying to involve others. 
Thank you, Amrita. I think we're starting to see a pattern emerge uh, actually from all of our speakers. There is definitely agreement that there needs to be uh, legislation that needs, if for legislation to be effective, it needs to be based on norms, whether these are international established norms and principles, these have to be international technical norms and principles, and there is a lot of call for harmonization of efforts, uh, whether it is across, you know, smaller subregions, uh, especially paying in mind the different uh, technological advancements, the diversity of these different uh, technological advancements of the different nations inside our, um, you know, our region, Asia Pacific is very diverse. We have the very, very advanced nations, including Japan. And then we also have other different concerns, especially perhaps in uh, South Asia and also in the Pacific Islands. We also heard that, you know, we also need to look at market demand. There is market demand and there is the user demand. And then sometimes these things do there could be conflict in there. And then we need to look at also how we can develop responsible AI guidelines, regulations, or legislation in a way that can benefit uh, the people that it's supposed to serve. And here I want to kind of do a quick second round before I open it up to, I guess, the floor for any questions. Um, one of the, the things that we've heard is, you know, harmonization. Uh, Asia Pacific who are at the table, those who are not at the table, how can we be at the table? Um, so I do wanna kind of, maybe we can start with, with Noya. Um, how do you think that policymakers can engage effectively in regional cooperation to address these global challenges related to AI? Thanks, Jan, for that question. Um, what I want to highlight here, I don't wanna keep it, I'll keep it short um, is, actually linked to my intervention in the beginning. And um, this time I will take a look at the regional cooperation among Pacific Islands, um, uh, specifically in addressing a global challenge related to AI. I would like to point out a couple of strategies that I believe from the perspective of small island um, countries will allow the engagement of uh, policymakers in addressing uh, global challenges to AI. Um, you know, in the morning, there was a session in the morning, um, one of our colleagues from Samoa, uh, Lefao, kind of flagged um, in the, uh, the, the need for parliamentarians to be trained and make aware of um, on emerging, you know, the impact of emerging technologies in the Pacific. So what, so the question is, what can we do? Uh, what we can do, we can develop platforms, opportunities, uh, not just for policymakers, but as, of course, for experts in the region and other key stakeholders that, you know, we can, like I mentioned before, that we can use to share our knowledge, our experience and best practices in um, addressing um, AI related challenges in the region. So for instance, um, the Pacific Island uh, Forum Secretary, those regions and other regional organization could, could of course facilitate this kind of discussions and um, AI impact in, um, in the region. Uh, one of the uh, most important um, aspect of looking at, you know, um, the contribution of policymakers and how they can collaborate is um, development of policies and harmonization, like you mentioned before, Jen. Um, uh, we need to develop a common policy, like a, fr a framework, a regulatory guidelines for AI um, adoption and, of course, governance side of it. And I, I think this could um, involve sharing expertise on issues, such as, uh, like I mentioned before, data privacy, ethics, those are, um, are the, the, the issues that we, we face in, the, in, in the, the Pacific Island countries. And maybe we can create a, a more consistent approach to AI regulation across the region, because our region is, like you said before, it's very diverse. Uh, we have different cultures um, and we have to respect our cultures and our values as well. Um, one of the other key uh, strategy I was looking at, I think it will work in the case of, uh, of small island developing state is um, how uh, we can create a Pacific Island AI kind of strategy, you know, policymakers are the, the, the ones that, you know, um, can do the final saying, and they can collectively develop comprehensive um, strategies like this to tailor to the unique challenges and uh, opportunities of the Pacific Islands. And this kind of strategies, um, I believe that it could outline the region's, uh, the region's vision for AI adoption, 
as well as the regulate um, understanding the regulatory principles uh, how we can invest what are the priorities investing in you know um, adopting these emerging technologies and what are the plans that we should address in terms of you know taking into account ethical and social implication in the from from the perspective of small island um, countries. I also want to touch base on the, how public and private sector collaborations. It, it's very important because um, policy makers can actually collaborate with both the public and of course the private sector, and they can drive AI initiatives. And I think, and I believe that engaging with, um, you know, policy makers, getting that training, get to understand what technology is about and what these emerging technologies can bring to the nations, to, to our small nations, engaging them with technology companies, research institution and uh, local industry can of course lead to, you know, um, join projects that address regional challenges and, you know, at the same time promote economic growth in some sense. So it's, it's, um, very specific of how policy makers can engage in regional co uh, cooperation around the um, around the area of AI in, uh, in the Pacific. But sometimes it varies based on geographic dynamic, um, dynamics as well as uh, the individual country priorities and development. You know, we have a very diverse culture and uh, tradition, so it, it needs to be understand from that level. Thank you. Thank you, Noya. This is really good, very concrete uh, suggestions of how we can move forward in, in the Pacific. Um, I am going to pause here a little bit to see if there's any reactions around the room or the online room, because I do know that I think there was a comment here, and this was probably back when Mamta was, was actually uh, giving a very good comprehensive look on AI ethics and all of the uh, rights-based concerns that you know, we're looking at, at ethical and responsible AI development. Um, perhaps, I don't know if I can read this or if let us, let, I'm sorry, I, I'm going to pronounce your name wrong, Letasti, um, if you don't mind, um, I don't know if you're still around if you wanted to take that or I can also read it. It says for AI advocacy and policy, development and inclusion requires a collaborative and holistic approach that involves met engagement with various stakeholders, including civil society organizations, academia, the private sector, per persons, uh, people with disabilities, and citizens themselves. Um, I think that also kind of harkens back to what Noya just shared with us. There needs to be public and private uh, um, collaboration. And of course, listening to all of the stakeholders that AI would impact. Um, maybe now I can kind of expand the strategy a little bit more to um, the global discussion. I know Amrita would like to share a little bit more about the discussion uh, in terms of the policy network on AI and also the ways that um, and it's currently being discussed. Amrita, if you could shed some light on PNAI. Sure. Uh, thanks, Jen. Uh, just to uh, expand on the abbreviation, it's the Policy Network on Artificial Intelligence, uh, which is uh, kind of housed within the IGF. As in last year, there was a main session on AI and there was a discussion that, that there needs to be a platform where uh, people can come and discuss on frameworks and try to come up with something, with, you know, to come on common ground. So that's the genesis of the Policy Network. And this year, the policy network is actually looking at three main aspects. And this is a community driven activity wherein we have, um, you know, people from who are working on AI from all parts of the globe. And it's not restricted only to global north, rather this time we are focusing more on global south. So one of the main aspects being looked on is interoperability, as in um, by interoperability, mean, we mean interoperability of AI regulations, governments, Regime, governance regimes and frameworks, you know, uh, since countries and regions across the globe are developing policies and rules for AI, to what extent do these policies and regulations converge? Uh, could increased global interoperability of AI governance uh, strengthen the impacts towards AI that respects human rights? Um, then the other track is on gender and race, uh, for example, 
do AI systems and harmful biases reinforce racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia in the society and under which circumstances could AI be forced for good at improving gender and racial equality uh, and AI and environment. So these are the three aspects which are looking at and what they are doing is they're not reinventing the wheel, they are looking at what different um, places are doing or what different frameworks. For example, in interoperability, they're looking at the different frameworks broadly, which all are talking about interoperability uh, and then trying to see if there is any cohesion um, or if there is any commonality. Similarly, they're trying to look at um, how the AI uh, is, uh, you know, you know the, how to, uh, are there any frameworks to address issues of race, uh, race gender, et cetera, because we know those are prevalent. And also about environment and AI, and they're looking at projects in different parts of the world, Africa and some other places, as to how it is being used to enhance uh, the environmental um, good. So these are certain things, and these are open groups you can join and discuss. Why we say this is important and we want community members uh, and also parliamentarians, if they have time to come in and uh, just look at them is because you don't have to always reinvent the wheel. There are people who have already done something or some work is happening. These are places where you get capsule doses of the information. And if you like something, you can dwell deeper into it. Um, because there needs to be a common place where people can come and non-judgmentally discuss things. Uh, many times we see in, you know, when national policies are made, it is the governments who are deciding or some techno, you know, big tech companies are coming many times. Civil society or academia do not come in. But what happens at the IGF platform, et cetera, is it's open. You have the national region, IGFs coming in, youth participation. You have different communities coming and they give different perspectives. Um, because AI is not restricted to just some people, it manifests in different ways for different people. So the more feedback you get, good, bad, the more nuanced could be the approaches which even uh, you know, decision makers can take in their own countries. Also, they can bring the perspective of their countries uh, into these discussions. So it's a two-way traffic. Um, while you can get in something, you can also give to enrich the discussion so that, you know, uh, we can't get it perfect, but we can at least try to get somewhere because no uh, parliamentarian, no government or no decision maker wants to make a bad regulation. Unfortunately, um, you know, because things are such, it, it, it's, uh, you know, and AI, just as someone mentioned in the chat, it's so fluid that, you know, technology, uh, by the time a regulation comes, technology moves 10 times, uh, 10 feet ahead. So I think to get it right, we need to have more discussion, just as we are, uh, Noya mentioned, more discussion amongst different stakeholders, more public discussion. I think that's important. Many times in our nation, in our regions, we don't have that. Uh, getting everyone, even the young people to discuss because they use it much more and it's their future. Thank you. Thanks, Amrita. I'm now going to actually open the floor to see if there's any questions and I see, Ian with his hand up already. Good, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for um, the, the fascinating discussion so far. Sorry, my name is Ian Sheldon. I'm from the Department of Infrastructure in the Australian government. Um, I, I just had quite a, quite a simple question really. Uh, AI is quite a burgeoning field um, and we're seeing a lot of industry uh, spring up in, in a range of different countries, different maturity levels. Um, and I'll, I'm wondering if, if I'd be able to get some reflections from the panel on, on challenges in regulating AI when you have quite a varied domestic industry. Um, I, I know that you know, a lot of countries in our region have smaller or larger industries with varying levels of expertise. And, and sometimes it's easiest to, to go to your local industry to ask them for advice. But, but when you don't have as deep of a local history on the subject matter, it, it makes regulating things things a little difficult. So I, I'd be curious about what we might be able to do to overcome some of those challenges from a, from a regional perspective. That's probably the most difficult question of the day, uh, Ian. Um, 
Look, I think your point resonates really well. I think some, something that we've been hearing as well is that it's very difficult to engage, let's say, in the AI governance regulation standardization debate if you do not have a domestic industry that you can either tap into for advice, but also because the majority of the drivers for any kind of regulation or standardization comes from industry as well. Um, <clears throat> So I think, for instance, in the Australian context, we've had a debate, oh, Australia needs to do more, but hey, where is our industry compared to so many others? It's, it's kind of hardly anywhere. Um, and I think that's even more challenging, let's say, in the situation of, let's say, the Pacific Islands or, or, or in parts, parts, of, parts of Central Asia. Um, so I think that's, that, that's a real challenge. Um, and I think, in a way, the only way to overcome that is, is probably kind of thought through certain regional mechanisms um, and, and maybe kind of as, a, as, an, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an example, which is not related, but maybe serve as an example is that, um, uh, and I think we talked about it during the APR dev as well, when you want to kind of manage um, uh, content on social media platforms. If Australia calls Facebook, Facebook will pick up the phone. If Tuvalu calls, they will probably not pick up the phone. Hence, there is a role, let's say, regionally for a bigger player, let's say, to take, not be responsible, but take a responsibility for, let's say, smaller nations, smaller economies. Um, and maybe in the AI example, that would be, let's say, teaming up with certain countries that have uh, a particular industry or have a, have, have a, have a decent industry. Uh, so for Australia, I think, uh, we would obviously work together with allies and partners um, on the other side of the Pacific Ocean, um, probably in some countries in Asia Pacific, uh, they would be looking for expedition advice uh, from their big, uh, big neighbors. Um, because I think without that industry, you might wonder what's the point of us investing lots of time and energy in actually regulating or, 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 or investing in governance mechanisms. Um, maybe then you're better off just wait and see what's, what's coming. Um, if, if that risk is, is acceptable. Um, and maybe that's also a segue, maybe into a reflection on, the, on, on uh, the previous speaker, is that I think obviously there is, especially in forums like this, um, it is good to kind of find platforms for dialogue and find common ground. But I think at the same time, when it comes to uh, the development of AI technologies and developing uh, a global mechanism or a regional mechanism for governance of it, I think we should not fool ourselves that this is a matter of geopolitical or geoeconomic contest at the moment. Yeah, there, there is a reason why it's so hard as to come to common agreement. That's because there are fundamental differences in what is right. So before you get to a question of getting it right, you, you first have to find agreement of what is right. And I think there are fundamental differences between let's say what Australia thinking and what the thinking is in Beijing and what the thinking is in Moscow. Um, and I think that's, and we see that playing out, let's say at a political level, we see that playing out, let's say economically, where let's say the interests of, let's say the AI industry uh, in the US is opposed to the AI industry, for instance, in China. Um, and, and that's also a matter of, let's say, national economic strife. So whoever, whichever economy, whichever country finds that edge, um, will have a technological advantage for the decades to come. So it is of super high politics at the moment. And it doesn't mean that we should not have these conversations here. They are required and it needs to be on the table, but that's not gonna solve the bigger question, the big G question of governance and the big R regulation. Thank you. Just adding on, um, just sufficiently looking, we can see three um, three key dimensions of global politics in Asia Pacific region. First is advanced economies like UK and EU that are spearheading the regulatory process. Second is um, AI innovators within the region, uh, like um, India, China, South Korea, who are saying that no, you're going to dampen our regu like our AI industry. So we are going to develop it, but in our own way. It's they're a little skeptic. And third is countries like us who do not have any AI and we sort of feel like we do not have any leverage and maybe no say in what is actually happening. So I guess this is pretty similar to major developments that have happened in the history, say nuclear weapons or uh, space race or even issues of climate change. So just the fact that we do not have certain 
uh, certain uh, innovations does not mean that we cannot be involved in the yeah discussion though so and uh, when jennifer first started the panel she gave example of uh, un calling out for an advisory group that is definitely that sort of shifts the landscape a little in this regard and it also provides a platform for um, say developing countries to have their voice in this matter and not just that i i think um, as i said before the regulatory framework, I understand that AI definitely incorporates a lot of nuanced thing, but then there are basic things such as data privacy and misinformation and disinformation data harvesting and that those are regulations that all the countries can have in their national or even in regional framework and just engage in discussion, maybe to develop these mechanisms in such countries so i believe that well even though like there might not be a dedicated ai industry there are areas where we can contribute especially in academic and civil civil society structure and also to ensure that something that happened with nuclear weapons can also maybe happen with ai thank you thank you mamta um i already see we have amrita with a hand up in the zoom room but Right before I give the floor to Amrita, I noticed that there is a comment online from Ying Chu Chen, and it's to agree with Bart. And there is competition between different regions, and she's underlining the point that there is, you know, geopolitics really do play a very huge part in this discussion. Um, Amrita, please go ahead. Thank you, I am. That is a very tricky question, and I'll just uh, kind of build in from what we are seeing in India, uh, and I'll just limit it to that. So, we, uh, if you look at it, uh, the government is encouraging um, indigenous industries, uh, local entrepreneurship in AI, and they are coming up. But when the governance of AI is actually being spoken, it is uh, more. Uh, I would say, looked at from the big tech, because their effect of harm is much higher than, um, you know, a small startup, for example. If we look at the Indian um, companies which are coming up, if they come to some scale, then they, uh, you know, get into more discussions on governance, etc. But when uh, a startup is just starting or a small medium enterprise, they are more on expansion, uh, looking at business, etc. So even from a business, their interests vary with their skill. Um, so um, we, we see very less participation from small, medium industries or startups, but they have industry associations who represent them and they get into these discussions. So many times it may not be the smaller companies who are getting into the governance discussion, but they're, um, the people who represent them gets into these discussions. And uh, kind of bringing them to the discussion happens. And many times what we are seeing in the regulations which are coming up, uh, we don't have an AI regulation, but we have a framework which has come up. But in other regulations is, there is some leeway given to the smaller industry so that they can thrive because, um, and and if you look at even EU and other places, uh, more penalties, more liabilities are put on, um, you know, the bigger platforms who have certain value, certain number of customers, etc, because the harms are there. So I don't think I've been able to answer your question, but this is what we see. Uh, hope that helps. Thanks, Amrita. I think Ian is very happy with the, the responses. He's been nodding and smiling. Um, I think it's really important to have this discussion here because we are so much at the beginning stages of a lot of things cropping up. And the importance of uh, the kind of cooperation and harmonization in subregions, across the region, and globally cannot be un like underscored. This is extremely important for us. I want to see if there's any more questions from the floor or online or really, really tricky ones for our panelists. Any, any of those? Okay. If we don't, let's actually look to the future. I think this is, um, have been a very productive I would call it an initial discussion. We're kind of mid-flight here, but still at the early stages. But what I really want to, to get a sense, I guess maybe just from all the panelists is, what do you see, um, where do you see the cooperation can be strengthened strategically going forward? Where do you see the, the future, uh, at least the near future 
um, that will be determinative for the governance of AI, both within the Asia Pacific region, and then I guess maybe if you want to touch on it on a, on a more global level. Um, I don't know, Noya, if you would like to start. Yep, thank you, uh, Jen. I think uh, speakers um, have sh um, shared quite, you know, very strategic views of how we tackle this. And um, just to touch base on what we've discussed before, I mean, uh, about the question, uh, I'm stepping back and looking at the Pacific Island nation and the challenges. And, you know, I look at international collaborations and uh, it, it's very important for small Pacific Island countries. And I like how Bart mentioned about the call and it's, 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 it's a reality. Um, big uh, companies, they don't um, take calls from small island nations of say 10,000 population. Um, and it's, it's, it's where we need the international collaborations between neighboring countries, uh, especially in the region and other, re other region that can share the best practices and exchange knowledge with you know, small island countries like us. And um, also um, I wanna look at the diverse re rep representation, like ensure that the, the AI development teams and decision-making bodies are you know, diverse and inclusive. Uh, representing different backgrounds and perspective, not just, you know, from some part of the world, but take it from all, all the region. I think this can help uh, prevent bias and ensure um, a broader understanding and potential ethical issues. Um, the importance of uh, working collaboratively uh, with policy maker, I, I, I would really, um, I think it will ensure that um, AI technologies are developed and used in ways that respect um, human rights. Um, it promotes fairness and contribute positively to the region's uh, development and well-being. Thank you. I'll just very naturally go down the line, maybe just your key takeaways about the strategy for the new future, Bart. Yeah, thanks. Um, if I would have to sum it up, I think um, we're still very much kind of in what I would call kind of a shaping phase of the debate, right? So we're still, even though it has been ongoing for a number of years, it's still kind of in exploring where where, where is this debate going? Um, and I did, and I think that's why we see so many different initiatives, parallel initiatives, competing initiatives um, um, popping up at the moment. Um, um, there is, I think, the, the global partnership on AI that, um, uh, that was referred to, uh, which India is chairing at the moment, which I think it's only been very new, only been two or three years in existence, but a very exciting initiative, but it still has to deliver. Um, we now see the UK um, um, initiating an AI safety summit to be held later this year. Um, last year, no, earlier this year, there was the initiative by the Netherlands and the Koreans to have a summit on responsible use of AI in the military context. There is the UN Secretary General's initiative. So all, all things that are extremely relevant and it's kind of shaping the future debate of let's say what governments will look like. Um, we cannot attend each and every single initiative. So I think in particular, let's say for our, our friends in the Pacific, our friends in Asia, I think looking for what are the platforms to have our voices heard and determined, I think is really important and to determine who is kind of the spokesperson for the region. Is that a bigger country, um, not being Australia, um, is that uh, uh, a regional forum of some sort? Is that ASEAN, the Pacific Islands Forum, or something else? Um, I think that's one thing. The other thing I think that's really important, I think what this debate also shows is that we're looking at similar, I think, to kind of lots of the internet, internet discussions is in which domain are we looking at this? Is it, let's say, from a security perspective? Is it from an economic or from a development perspective? And I think um, if you are in, in each and every jurisdiction, I think this is the time to kind of make up your mind where are our greatest concerns, but also where are our greatest opportunities. If that sits kind of in the economic and development sphere, then this is the moment kind of to define that for yourself and find who are kind of your, your entry points and your spokespersons to deliver those messages. And I think for a large part of our region, um, I think the focus sits more on the economic and development side uh, and the opportunity sides of, of AI and other new technologies rather than the security side, um, which is, I think, uh, back to my point in the first in the previous round, uh, a very, I think, tense debate at the moment it will be very hard to engage. Thank you. Uh, so um, my uh, key take takeaway will be that for a, for, for a small country like Nepal and for developing countries across the globe, definitely the 
best thing would be to have a international framework and um, a bodies like the advisory group where we can actually come and voice our opinion. But till then, uh, till that happens, um, and also we have to understand the reality and the global politics, like how arms race begins, space exploration race begins. This is also a global race, and we cannot really ask a, any country to step down. Like NAS NASCOM, uh, the report from NASCOM actually stated that by 2025, AI would bring around $500 billion, uh, it would add $500 billion to Indian economy. And we can definitely not ask them to stifle it based on a regulation that has you know that might have such a person so for now even if um, uh, there are um, individual initiative from different countries in regard to regulation we should definitely promote uh, advisory bodies where we can have hold dialogues as such and the cooperation across government uh, industry and expert should include ordinary users, civil society group, like small tech companies, maybe engineers, policymaker, lawyers, so that um, we can go back home and um, we, can, um, we can tell our people what the discussion is about and how the government can actually contribute to a global discussion in that matter. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Mamta, and over to you. Amrita, your key takeaways and what is the strategy for the new future? Thank you, Jen, as in I agree with what the speakers have uh, before me had mentioned here. Just a few things, um, since AI and generative AI is still, I would say, unfurling its wings, we need to agree on some broad frameworks, but we should not stifle it. For example, many times we see regulations coming in, in the name of, uh, you know, misinformation, disinformation, it goes into censorship. Uh, we've seen it in countries like ours and in many places. So. There needs to be some caution before bringing in regulations, but agreeing on broad principles is important. Second is there needs to be more discussion, dialogue within regions, within blocks, so that at least the composite power can help uh, negotiate, because these are negotiations, even in a UN platform, it is negotiation, member states vote. So if the blocks agree on certain things and they vote accordingly, um, you know, as Bart mentioned, it's geopolitics, it's business, um, but, uh, and countries need their economies also, as well as protecting individual rights. So I think more conversations are important. Second, the the discussions which are happening, for example, even, you know, in smaller ways, the, uh, say, the synthesis document which is coming out from APRIGF may have some messages. Uh, okay, perhaps if we can circulate them, uh, they may not be, uh, you know, very detailed submission, you know, uh, I would say analysis or research, but those high level statements help. For example, even IGF comes up with messages, there would be clear messages even on AI coming up this year. So if those are percolated, um, to the countries, to different stakeholders, that's important. Third is dialogue within the country itself amongst different people. Many times regulations are made by policymakers, lawyers, um, bureaucrats, um, some business people, but people from the technical community are not involved, are not brought into the discussion. Their being there in the table as well as civil society and academia is important because um, you know many times Implementation of a regulation is a challenge because technically it may not be possible. Um, so I think the conversations have to happen with everyone involved um, and get the and keep the conversation flowing. I think that's important and make companies accountable, big or small. If they are using our data, it has to be used in an ethical, proper way, as in, uh, you know, many times you don't even know. Uh, we have seen abuses. Uh, you have signed up for something and the data is being used for something else. And what we are doing, that data is being used to train AI. So we need to be cautious about those things too. Thank you. Thank you, Amrita. A lot of really good key takeaways from all of our panelists. We heard that there needs to be harmonization. There needs to be, uh, uh, it needs to be rooted in international standards and norms, in technical standards and norms, and in agreed upon norms that is rights-based. And we also heard that, especially for Asia Pacific region, there are different levels of development and that needs to be also a, a very important part of the consideration because some states could have a bigger voice when they're looking to industry, the market forces and big tech. And, and others do rely on things like the multi-stakeholder advisory 
board that is currently being called for for AI to be able to participate in these processes. Um, I think um, Amrita did mention Personally, I've seen a proliferation and interest in discussing uh, emerging technology, especially with respect to AI, both in the regional um, meeting that just concluded yesterday, the Asia Pacific uh, Regional IGF had a lot of sessions this year that wanted to talk about AI and its impacts in all kinds of uh, uh, points of view. And I know coming forward in, in Kyoto, um, the global IGF in, in October, there is also a lot all very interesting sessions that will be talking about AI and its impacts, especially in the context of governance and in the context of internet governance. And I really hope that the takeaway here is even, I'm just to borrow a phrase from, from um, um, Bart, we are right at the very beginning here, and but it is very important to be able to shape this conversation in the way that can we can fully leverage AI for good to balance and enhance the good and, and to understand the risks and be able to, to move forward uh, inside the region, inside the sub-regions, and as always uh, globally as well, towards something that could really truly benefit the development process. So with that, I'll give you all back five minutes unless somebody has a really burning question that they've suddenly thought of in the last moments. No burning questions in the room and also not online. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you to the panelists for this really enriching and engaging conversation and discussion. Thanks, Jen. Thank you.